I apologize. Yeah. Uh, technically, you said it is. Um, we'll be back with you very shortly. Okay, so um, do you remember when? Okay, so let's take a look at some of the data from 1974 and 1996. If we look at Norway, where there was 92% 90, coverage of the vaccine that protects you against pertussis, you see a reduction. In neighboring Sweden, there was no DTP coverage because of an active anti-vax movement. You see an increase in pertussis, which was, is, and was a major killer of children in the past. In Spain and Portugal, you see, you see that Spain has 88% coverage that started uh, and so it declined uh, the rates of pertussis, whereas Portugal has had a 93% coverage, a five-dose schedule, and it's maintained itself at close to zero incidence of pertussis. If we look at this situation with Sweden, we see that Sweden had a high, uh, high rate of pertussis until the DDP vaccine was introduced, and then there was a decline. And then there was an, a, a massive increase in the anti-vax movement, where people were opposed to having their children vaccinated with this particular vaccine, and suddenly you see an increase following. In this particular situation in Japan, you see the same situation where the DTP was introduced in 1947. There was a rapid decline in pertussis, and then when the vaccine was interrupted by the, by the anti-vax movement, then you see an increase So Then they brought in a new vaccine, which brought the levels down again. So every time we had the anti-vax movement showing effectiveness and success in reaching the population. We see a decline in vaccinations and an increase in the diseases those vaccinations were designed to protect. Uh, likewise, in the Russian Federation, we see that the movements against whole cell, whole cell pertussis vaccines was interrupted in the Russian Federation and it became stable. In England and Wales, we see declines uh, in the, we see a decline until the, the anti-vax movement was active and it eventually started bringing the levels of the pertussis disease up. Now, the anti-vax movement did not begin in the last couple of decades. It's hundreds of years old, and we're gonna take a look at the anti-vax uh, movements back in 1772. This is the time of Jenner when he was working with the cowpox vaccine for, for smallpox. There was a Reverend Edmund Macy in England who called the vaccine diabolical operations in a 1772 sermon. And he basically argued that God intended for these people to suffer and die. So why do we have a vaccine here that's interfering with God's will? So therefore, this is an evil, diabolical plot that's meant to destroy humanity and its values. Now, the newly re there was a revitalization of the anti-vax movement. Now, this has always been at a low level. We've always had a small percent of people who have always opposed vaccines. But we've never had a serious problem. And when occasionally, when the anti-vax movement was increasing, we typically would have an outbreak or an epidemic that people became afraid, and then everybody supported vaccine programs. We had a sudden increase in the vaccine's program support. However, when there is no disease there, when the levels are very, very low, and people don't see the disease, 
that is being protected, that the children are protected from by these vaccines, then you often don't have that kind of support. Now there's a man named Andrew Wakefield, and anybody who knows anything about the vaccine movements in, in the world, you know about Andrew Wakefield. He's a former British doctor in 1998 who, in Lancet, one of the top journals in the world, in the medical, medical field, he had research, a research article that claimed that 12 cases of autism demonstrated that autistic symptoms followed NMR vaccination and suggested that the vaccine was causing autism. You may have heard that in the anti-vax movement that autism is caused by vaccines. It so happens that this was retracted in 2010 following an investigation. He, he actually faked, fabricated a number of those cases. He reported them incorrectly. And, and he was actually lost his license to practice medicine. Not only because of the fabrication in the publication, but because he was also dishonesty, because of dishonesty in his practice and abuse of developmentally delayed children having experimentation on them with new and very invasive uh, medical procedures. Uh, and so he lost his medical license. Lancet retracted the, of the article because it was not scientifically based. Many of his co-authors condemned it because they realized that he did a lot, he, there's a lot of fabrication in the paper. And yet today, many people are still concerned about autism being caused by the MMR, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. Andrew Wakefield is well known for his research fabrications. He had no research credentials. There was a conflict of interest in his research. The reason he published this paper in the first place is that he was working with a lawyer who was suing the vaccine companies for this child that had developed autism as a result of the vaccine, supposedly. There was no evidence for that, so he created this paper, published the paper, so he could show that there's evidence to win the case, and so he would gain a substantial amount of money. So there was definitely a conflict of interest in this research. And there was malpractice in his, in his medical practice. And, there was, and he was still yet the impetus for the modern anti-fax movement. He was struck off the, US, the UK medical registry because he abused his position of trust, quote unquote, and brought the medical profession into disrepute in the studies he carried out. So you would think that he would have no impact on the anti-vaccine movement. This is how the anti-vaccine movement responded. He became a hero. He became a savior. He became a victim. And this is one of the, this is from a website in the anti-vaccine movement. He has lost his country, his practice, and his license for being right. It's time to stop making him out to be a villain. Now, we, we are facing this in, in the richer countries. We didn't respond to this. The anti-vaccine movement received lots of impetus because he would travel all over the world speaking to different groups. He would, has all kinds of websites, all kinds of publications in, on the websites uh, to prove that Vaccines are dangerous. Vaccines cause autism and many other diseases. And he's making a huge amount of money in this new career of his. Uh, we can see that he even has invitations to very important places and associations that give him higher status in some countries like the United States among some circles. You can see that he get, regains a lot of support wherever he flies. You can just read the signs here, governed by medical corruption, scapegoat. He receives a lot of attention and a lot of support, and suddenly the, the anti-vax movement has received a huge amount of impetus 
in the richer countries, and now it's starting to spill over into the poor countries, into the medium income countries, because of this, uh, because of the websites that are available to everyone. So the anti-vax movement is based on a number of misconceptions. It's easily accessible in all major languages on the internet. It appeals both emotionally and intellectually to the, the average person and to physicians as well. It establishes credibility, establishes rapport. It plays on the fear for children's safety. It tells horror stories, stories that we cannot confirm. Once you start investigating the stories, they seem to disappear. It provides scientific evidence, quote unquote, against vaccines and multivalent vaccines in particular, vaccines that are actually produced to protect you from many different diseases. It plays on conspiracy theories by big pharmacological companies, the government, and it softens persuasion by supporting safe vaccines. So sometimes, instead of coming out and saying, I'm against vaccines, they say, we're for safe vaccines, but none of the present vaccines are safe. We want